All right, guys, let's get the party started. Claudio, I feel like this is really loud. It's nowhere close to my mouth. Test, test, test. Is that better? No. All right, guys, let's grab our coffees and make our way up. <clears throat> I'm trying to have you guys out of here by 11.45 before Sunday school gets out, so let's kind of settle in. Okay, let's start praying. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you because it's a wonderful day that you have made, Lord. And it's a beautiful day that we come into your house, Lord, and we share fellowship with one another, Lord. But we come and we sit at your feet, Lord. Lord, we come because you are a God who gives, Lord, as we just received your body and your blood, Lord. I ask that you just continue to give us in the upper room now. Lord, I ask that these... That this meeting, Lord, be your word, Lord. I ask that you make it personal to every single one of us, Lord. There's going to be sensitive topics that we're going to discuss, Lord, directly how you want us to shepherd. So I ask that you wrestle with our hearts individually, Lord. And I know that this is an area that none of us are perfect in, Lord, and all of us can experience growth. So I ask, Lord, that you just open our eyes to some of the changes that you want to see us make, Lord, because we know that these are changes that will be fruitful, Lord, for generations to come. So I ask, Lord, that your presence be so real with us today, Lord, that every single one of us takes directly from you. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, that you hear our prayers, lifted in the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, the Toko St. Mary, all the saints and martyrs. Here's we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who flies the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So if everyone can kind of settle in. All right. So I was trying to think about what are we going to talk about in the men's, I'm sorry, men's, sorry, wrong meeting, in the um, in adult meeting now. And I was trying to think of our next series, and to be honest with you, I completely and utterly struck out. So I'm not starting any series today, but instead I just wanted to talk about something that I felt was close to my heart, and I know as HTC, it's close to all of our hearts, because it's one of these things that actually was one of the core reasons we actually started, um, started this church. Uh, because for many of us here, this is, this is a church where you're going to see a lot of young families um, and even if you're not a young family, you probably are in a family. And I know that if there's one thing that today was Nehru's and we switched over in all of the Sunday school classes. And one of the things that you realize about HTC is we have a ton of kids, like more kids than you can ever even imagine. Um, I think we're probably two to one to three to one in, in kid to adult ratio. But yeah, we have a ton of kids. And so one of the things I was kind of thinking about that would be really applicable and something for us as parents to be thinking about, because if you look at all of the roles that you have in your life, right, all of the jobs that we possess, what's, the, what's one of the most important ones? It's being a parent, right? As much time, and you know, many of us put in probably at least 40 hours a week during the work, um, during the work week, and as much time we spend focused on that, we'll all say that that job is nothing compared to how important it is to be a parent. So what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit is about parenting on purpose um, or parenting with purpose, however you want to kind of word it. Because I think this is one of those jobs that if we're not intentional about it, next thing you know, you're going to blink, your kids are going to be all grown up and you're going to wonder, hey, where did the time go? Like I was just thinking about this because I got one of my nephews that I still remember the day that he was born, right? And it seems like it was yesterday. And on Wednesday, he's, he's, he's leaving for college, right? And I was just like, man, that kind of flew by. And then I thought about it, and my oldest is 16, right? He's a junior. Remember the day that he was born, and I figured I'd get his junior year and his senior year, and then he's off as well. So I wanted us to think about this and, and really to, to not overlook how important and the duties that are assigned to us as being parents. Um, so I started to think about it, and really, as parents, I think we have three main jobs, okay? The first one, keep them alive to the best of our ability, right? I've got four boys. That's harder than it sounds, okay? So, but the first big picture goal is just keep them alive, right? To the best of our ability, right? 
the second the second like you know big picture goal is to help these children grow up into being functioning adults who can take care of themselves right like that's every single one of us nobody wants to raise a kid that's always going to be living in the basement right we want them to be able to function as adults to grow up to contribute to society and ultimately to get out of my house that is a very very important goal if you did everything but you're still living with me then i i messed up somewhere right like we've got to arrows in the hands of a warrior right what's he do you, you pull him back you let him go and hopefully it leaves right it's there's no use in my quiver so and and the third the third thing uh, major goal is honestly it's to disciple them right we got to keep them alive we got to turn them into adults but in reality we've got to disciple them we have to leave them to christ and we have to help them grow in grace in their relationship with christ because if you do the first two and you miss out on the third one i guarantee you as a parent you're going to be broken hearted Right, that, that is, you know, we kind of joke around, but I would say of the three, that, dude, that's really, really, really important. So today I wanted to talk about a little bit what it looks like to kind of parent with purpose. And there's this beautiful portion of scripture that we're going to cover. It's going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And 2 Timothy was written to St. Timothy, but it was actually written by St. Paul. And St. Paul's writing, this is St. Timothy, who became a bishop in Ephesus, um, but it really, it, he, he touches on some nice things about how St. Timothy became such a godly young man. And in, in 2 Timothy, actually, uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, it says, I call you to remembrance, a genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it is in you also. So where does it say that St. Saint, Saint Timothy's faith came from? It said it came from his grandmother and his mother, right? And I guarantee you, and then one, I heard this great quote about faith where it says, it's not taught, it's caught, right? And, and, and although I love that saying, I'm going to say that, I honestly, I kind of want to change a little bit. And I, I think it's caught and taught, right? Because we have to do both as parents, right? And ironically, when you look at this passage, where's the dad in the picture, right? There's no mention of the grandfather or the father, Right? So it, it shows that even homes where both parents aren't present, they are not excluded from God's work, right? And I think a lot of the times if we look at our, our, some households, our households look less than perfect because there's a deficiency, right? But here we see even the, Saint, the, the home of St. Timothy, there is no mention of a male figure at all, right? But you see that St. Timothy ended up not just being a great guy, but he ended up being a leader of the church. He ended up being a bishop over Ephesus. And he plays a major role. And personally, I believe that a lot of times we'll look at some houses, we'll be like, there's a deficiency there. And you know what? Looking at it from the outside, there very much might be a deficiency there. But I personally believe that God works double times in those houses, right? And I've seen houses where you look at it, you say it doesn't make sense for, you know, the, for this to be a fruitful home. But you see that very godly children come out of them because it's God's job right? It's what he is doing and where he is working. So then when you get into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, but says, you must continue in these things which you have learned and been assured of, a knowing from where you have learned them. And, and from childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And I love this because Christianity has a ton of principles. And, we, and, and I don't want to downplay that because a lot of the times people think like, you know, my relationship, it's my heart. You know, it's all about my heart. It's my relationship with God. And it doesn't really uh, involve a whole lot of other stuff. But I'm going to tell you that I don't, I don't think that that's true. Because in reality, this book, the Holy Scriptures, is full of principles that we need to know them. We need to believe them. We need to live them out. But I will also tell you that like, you know, when we talk about parenting and what parenting looks like, Parenting is not a lecture series. It is not a bunch of lectures that you give your kids just to make sure that they know all of these principles and what the Bible says. And it's funny, I, I, I'm very guilty of this. If you, you actually, if you ask my kids, if you ask even like my nephews, they joke around about it because they say whenever you go to Uncle Peter's house, you get life lessons. Because whenever we're talking about something, I say, okay, boys, this is a life lesson, like the Bible teaches. <laughs> and I think it's very easy for us to fall into that, right? But parenting is so much more. Like we can teach, 
we can tell what this Bible says. We can even make them memorize it frontwards, backwards. We can do all of that other stuff. But in reality, teaching is such a small part of it. It's an important part, but it's a small part of it as compared to what we model. Like, how are we living this, right? Last, my last trip to Africa, we went to a school and, um, and they had this sign on the wall. And man, like it, it, I read it and I, it just hit. And it says, children have never been good at listening to their elders, but they have also never failed to imitate them. And that is such a good quote, right? Because we say things all the time, right? But what we really end up doing is we realize that our kids look a lot more like us than we would like to admit, right? And usually it's not in the good. They pick up all of the other stuff. So as parents, um, it's so much more than what we teach, right? And the Bible's essential. And St. You know, Timothy's mom and, and grandma, what do they do? They did. It says that they, he made, like they taught him the Holy Scriptures. They taught him the Bible. And I love that because we have to know it. Like this is one of those things where I'm going to tell you that we have to be doing this with our kids. It's not the only thing, but we have to be teaching our kids what the Bible says. Because it says it taught him the Bible and it says that it made him wise, and after it made him wise, it made him wise for what? It said they made him wise for salvation. So you think about that. They, they took the time teaching their kids the Holy Scripture so that they would be wise for salvation. And I wonder, as parents, what is our plan for salvation for our kids? Do you have one? Do you have a way that you're intentionally trying to prepare your kids to make them wise for salvation? Because I will be honest with you, I am terrified that if our plan as parents for salvation to our kids is just bring them here. Because if your plan to salvation is I'm just going to bring them here, I'm going to tell you that's a miss. How many hours do we have them here? On a good week, right? If we wake up early, we might get them here for three or four hours. Let's say that we hit the cover off the ball, right? And we even show up on Saturday night for Vespers. I'll even round up and say, I'll give you two hours, right? Five hours a week. I'm going to tell you, if that is your plan for salvation for your kid, I don't know how effective it's going to be. I, 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 I just don't know, right? So the, the question is, is who will teach them? Who will model it for them, right? Who are you expecting to carry the burden of your kid's salvation? Because I will tell you, it is not, it should not be the church. It was not the church's job. The church is here to provide for us. It is to give us fellowship, to give us the sacraments, to give us the ways of salvation, to give us the proper teaching, the proper doctrine. But when you gave birth to that kid, whose responsibility was that kid? It was yours. It wasn't the church's. You don't find a drop box in front of the church where we can come drop our kids off and come pick them up back later. And when we pick them up, they're going to be Christian. That is an at-home activity that we have to sign up for. In 2 Timothy, a little bit later in that chapter, this is uh, chapter 3, 16 and 17. It says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I love this because it breaks down what, what, why we have the scripture. Okay, and it breaks it down into, into four, four buckets, right? The first one is teaching right? Teaching is easy. It's the do's and the don'ts, right? You got to know what's right. You got to know what's wrong. And a lot of the times, if we are drawing our own picture of right versus wrong, we screw it up. So we have to follow what the Bible is saying. When God says something's okay, it's okay. And if he says it's wrong, it's wrong. The second bucket, reproof, right? Helping kids understand where their behavior is sinful. And specifically, this is a conviction of sin, when we're in our word, and I will tell you one of the best quotes I ever heard was they said that this book will keep you away from sin or sin will keep you away from this book. Because when you're in the word of God, he will convict you. There is no way you can have sin in your life and be in your Bible and have him. He will be all over you. 
And if we were honest with ourselves, if that's uncomfortable and we don't not want to repent, what do we do? We stop reading it. So it, we need it for, for the reproof. We need it for the third bucket, which is correction, because this book also tells us is when we're in sin, which is inevitable, every single one of us is going to fall into it. But when our kids are in sin, they need correction. And the correction is, how do I make this right? Like, I messed up, I screwed up. How do I make it right? How do I grow in godliness? How do I pursue that? And that's the correction we find in this book. And then the last bucket, which is training in righteousness, right? So there's a certain point where it's not about not doing what's bad, right? Like, there's a certain point where, like, yes, we, we've got to stop doing what's bad. But there's this whole other area of our life where we should be growing into, which how do I thrive in doing what's good? If you're stuck in the, I don't want to do what's bad, that I'm telling you, like, you're stuck. Your car might have driven off the ditch, right? Because we're only meant to stay there for a period of time. And then we have to be about thriving and doing what's good and, and training ourselves in righteousness. And parenting needs to involve all four of those. It needs to involve all of them. And we can't do it without the Bible. And we cannot do it without involving the church. <clears throat> So, and then another thing that I was thinking about, right? And this is, this is it's, it's convicting to me. And honestly, if I was honest, I think we should be convicted as a church about this. Because how important should our kids' spiritual development be? Top five? Can we agree top five? Okay, maybe top three? Let me ask them. Should it be number one? Like your kids' spiritual development? Like, this is one of those, like, Sunday school answers, right? Where he said, yeah, it should definitely be number one, right? Like, our kids' spiritual development should be at the top of our list. It, there should be nothing more important than that. But compare it to other aspects of your kids' lives, right? And I'm telling you, I'm just as guilty as this, right? One of the things that I will tell you, as cops, the Coptic churches are some of the most successful churches out there, Right? I still remember when, I was going, when we were at St. John and we had another Protestant church that was like right across the street from us and we wanted to team up with them and we wanted to do a, um, like, a, um, it was a medical, like a medical clinic for people who didn't have insurance. So we were meeting with like the leadership over there and we said, hey, we were thinking about doing this. It'd be a nice opportunity for our churches to even just kind of get together and to, and to serve together, right? To, to give the opportunity for people who don't have insurance to have um, medical care. And this was like a, it was a big church. They had, they boasted about three to 5,000, you know, in attendance and stuff. And they said, we don't have any doctors. What do you mean you don't have any doctors? Like, yeah, we don't, we don't have any doctors at our church. And I was like, we got like a hundred of them. <laughs> our whole church is only like 500 people, right? <laughs> like literally 20% of our congregation are all doctors, right? Um, but it's funny, but like, it's true. Like when you look at our congregations, when it comes to like how we do professionally, we are very, very driven. We are a very successful people. We only have five professions, right? We have doctors, we have attorneys, we have CPAs, we have engineers, and I'm proud to say bankers have been added to the, to the mix, right? But like, that's all that we have because we are so driven when it comes to our careers. So I'm gonna ask you, and then look, I've got four kids who are all going through school right now. And we drive them to get good grades, right? We drive them that we want four O's and we want to make sure that they get into good colleges and we want to make sure they have successful careers. And I look at how much we drive them when it comes to their school and I compare it to how much we're driving them for spiritual growth. Are you convicted yet? I'm convicted, right? And I was like, okay, you know what? We're more concerned with how they're doing in their schoolwork than how they are doing professional. I mean, uh, spiritually. And then I started thinking about that. So, not to get too personal or to hit you too close to home, but that was normal. We've always been that way. But I would say, as of recently, we've seen something else kind of creep in, right? Because before it was make sure that they all do really well in school. But recently, I would say we also make sure that they really they do really really well in. Does anyone guess it? I, I, I had sports slash extracurricular activities, right? Because now each one of us is raising a messy, right? Like everybody's trying to think like if my eight-year-old isn't in like a travel team, he's not going to get onto his D1 team, right? And I, I remember like even like we know people who like five days a week, right? They're running their kids, 
right? And you got five days a week running their kids and then they're also doing their schooling. But do we ever check if they're even reading anything in the Bible? Do we ever check if they're actually praying like in a real prayer, right? And that's the thing, it just really, really convicts me because we'll all say that our, our kids' spiritual development should be our number one concern. But if you look at the way that we're living in my, my household included, right, it doesn't pan out that way. And as parents, there's a lot we need to teach our kids, right? Think about everything that we've been responsible in teaching our kids since birth, right? We taught them how to use a potty, how to tie a shoe, how to dress themselves, how to share, how to be a friend, how to handle their money, how to ride a bike, how to swim, how to clean their room, how to study, how to behave in public. The list can go on forever, right? All of this stuff that we basically have to teach our kids to do, right? And you think about it like that's like the stuff we're doing today, right? And then if you go back, you know, a couple thousand years, right? You go back to Moses' time, right? What did Moses, yeah, I was trying to think about what, you know, what did Moses, like what did his people care about, right? Like how to take care of a sheep, right? How to plant, how to sow, how to protect yourself from a wild animal, right? Where to go get the water from, how to handle a sword if you need to defend yourself, right? How to help deliver a baby in a tent because, you know, that's what, that's what happened back then, right? All of these practical skills of necessity of how to survive, like in that time that they were living. But if you look at Deuteronomy 6, when Moses left them instructions, it wasn't about any of that, right? So in Deuteronomy 6, Moses was instructing the people, and what did he care about? He cared about what he considered fundamental, right? It's Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 7. I'll just read through it real fast, right? And it says, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land when you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, that you may keep all of his statutes and his commandments of which I commanded you, and that your sons and your grandsons in all the days of our life, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you multiply greatly as the Lord of your fathers has promised you, a, flan, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And the words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you raise up. So the only thing that Moses was talking about was two things, their own commitment to God and then how they were going to pass it on to their children. Like that was the most important thing, right? How to know God, love God, serve God, fear God, trust God, obey God, and pass on God. That was the most important thing. think about that, guys. And I wonder, like, if we were going to use that ruler to measure how we're doing, how are we doing? You know, the point is that there's a chance that our priorities are a little bit out of whack, that we might be a little di bit disconnected from what we're being called to and what we're teaching our kids about priorities and where God falls into their own priorities. Because if we're pushing our kids so hard right about this is what's important this is a, this is what's important right and are the five things that we're pushing them in it's not god then what message are they picking up see because what happens is they're going to care about a lot of things in their lives other than their relationship with god and if we were honest we care about a lot of things in our lives other than our relationship with god because a lot of the times where do our kids pick up their priorities directly from us and how we're living so what do, our kids, what do our kids need from us the most, right? So first of all, I just want to tell you right now, top line, what our kids need the most? Um, they need parents that love God above all else. You know, you think about it. I said, what is the greatest commandment? It says, love the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, right? So what do our kids need? They need parents who are going to model that that are gonna show them what that looks like so they can understand it, so they can see it and that they can catch it. <clears throat> you know, I was reading something and I was talking about like all of these kids who are walking away from the faith in the college. And they said that there's basically two main reasons that kids walk away from the faith. The first one is they never heard the full gospel. 
And if you think about this, at first I was like, I don't buy it. But then I started reading it and I was like, no, I, I get what they're saying. For some reason, people think the gospel is God loves you. God wants you to be happy. Your life is going to be easy. If you play by your rules, everything's going to work out and you're not going to have any hardship. We've all heard that gospel, haven't we? The problem is, is that's not the gospel at all. That's not true. You're not going to find that anywhere in this book. Matter of fact, this book promises tribulation. It tells you times are going to get hard, right? And although there's portions of that that's true, right? Like the fact that God loves you and he does want you to kind of be happy or he wants to give you joy and satisfaction, um, you know, the rest of it's all wrong. So when life starts hitting hard, because we all know that life will start hitting hard, that these kids will end up rejecting Christ because they always felt that Christ was their get out of tribulation free card. And when it doesn't happen, they don't have any use for him anyways. The second reason that kids walk away from the faith is the hypocrisy they see. The hypocrisy they see in the lives of people who are claiming to be Christian, but their lives don't bear any evidence of being Christian. Right? And the hard part of that is a lot of these people see this hypocrisy I wish I would just say at church because we know that that's heartbreaking enough when you see that hypocrisy at church. But a lot of these kids are seeing that hypocrisy at home. And those are the closest people to them. So our, our kids need parents that do more than just drag them to church. They need parents who are going to show them a real and living transformational personal love for Christ and that they, that they, will, that they will walk in it. You know, they need parents who will teach and model what confession and repentance looks like in their own life. And my question for you guys is, do you guys screw up in front of your, in front of your kids? Like, I will tell you, my kids see my screw ups probably more than anybody else with the exception of my wife. Okay? But our kids are always watching. They always know when you do something wrong. And they will always call you on it. They'll call you on it verbally if they feel comfortable. And if they don't feel comfortable, what do they do? They take mental note, right? And they just remember that. And that's, that's when we need to show them that, you know, those four buckets we were talking about, the teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. We need to go show them that's not just for them. That's also for us, right? And when we screw up, we need to show them when we screw up and we need to confess it, right? A lot of times I'll even confess it to my kids if they were present when, when I did something stupid right? And I'll tell them that's not perfect either, right? And I'll model to them what confession looks like. I'll model to them what repentance looks like. If I've got to make it right somehow, right? Because we're the ones that we have to, we have to model it for them. And they've got to see that cycle in our life as well. Another thing that our kids need, our kids need parents who love each other. Like, let that sink in real quick. Our, our kids need parents who love each other. They need a loving, peaceful home where mom and dad see eye to eye. They don't have a perfect marriage, but that somebody who's working through it. You know, will your kids see some conflict at home? They should, right? A little bit of healthy conflict paired with healthy conflict resolution so they can understand what a loving home looks like. You know, because they say that nothing will give a kid a greater sense of security and emotional safety than a house where the mom and dad love each other. And our kids need parents who are uh, purposeful and intentional about raising them. And one of the things I want us to understand, because so many times we're in a society that's so like, you know, like we check the boxes, right? And I just want to tell you guys that we can have kids that get straight A's. They get scholar, uh, scholar scholarships that stay virgins, that don't do drugs, and they can do all of that stuff, and they can still be lost and far away from God. And, we have to, and that's why we minister to hearts, not by the outside, right? Not just checking the boxes of everything that they're, they, they look okay, right? But you've got to have a relationship with your kid where you can get a little bit intimate, and you get to know their heart and what's going on in there. And we need to be actively pointing our kids to Christ so they can grow in their own relationship with them their relationship with them. And we should, we should be involved in that and passing it to them to make sure that they are experiencing God correctly. And I'm going to close with this. God delights to answer in the prayer of a helpless parent. This is our hardest task as a parent, and it's never going to be too late to make adjustments because we don't have it all right all of the time. We never, ever will. Keep in mind, we know that this is hard. God knows that it's hard for us as well. We will not get it right all of the time. We might not even get it right half of the time. We will never be perfect parents, 
But we also have to remember that God, who was the perfect parent, every single one of our parents, he has prodigals too. And that's okay, right? But parents need grace because we're, we're gonna mess up a lot. But we have a God who pours out grace. And that's what we need to keep going back to. So it's up to us that we just have to be, we can try to be as purposeful and intentional as we can be. We, we go back to the well of God's grace all the time, and we hope that God gives us guidance in these matters. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and pray. I just want to let you guys know, I ran seven minutes over, but I'm going to blame it on you guys because we started late. Deal? Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because we know that this is, a, this is such a topic that's close to all of our hearts, Lord. And if I was honest with you, it's an important topic, but it's such a scary topic. And some, it's a topic that looks so much bigger than us and something that if, if I was honest, Lord, I would just feel like I'm failing. I'm failing in this, Lord. But Lord, I, I, I thank you because I know that you are a God who you will put your hand on the plow with my hand. And I ask that this be an area of our life where you are so active. So active, Lord, not because we need it, Lord, but so active because our kids need it. And we know that this is in line with your will for us. We know that you have a heart for our children, and this is your desire. So I ask for, for your own sake, for your next generation's sake, that you be an active participant in how we parent, Lord. If there's areas of our life that need change, open our eyes to it. Give us the courage to make those changes, Lord and encourage us along the way, and most importantly, pour out your grace on us. We need it so desperately. This is probably an area of our life where we feel defeated more often than anywhere else, like a failure, like unfit, Lord. But just cover us with your grace and let us remember, Lord, that this is your ministry. This is your purpose for us and that you'll be alongside with us. And I ask that you hear these prayers, lift in the session of all your saints from our tears. Hear us, we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day.